Before we begin this session, a few more books and something a little different. Uh, for those of you especially who weren't here yesterday, this uh, was mentioned. This is volume three of four. Uh, volumes one, two, and three are out on that book service. Um, it is a reformed systematic theology. It's Joel Beakey and it's Paul Smalley. I had the privilege of endorsing the series when the first volume came out, and I want to reinforce that endorsement. Uh, I saw a number of people with all three volumes, uh, which I was delighted to see. Truth should touch the affections. There's a lot of theology that you can read, and it's accurate, and it leaves you going, yeah. This doesn't do that, and it's one of the reasons why I appreciate it. Now, no real theology should leave you going, yeah. But you have to sometimes do quite a lot of hard work to get from the theology to the doxology. These volumes spur you to bridge the gap. Now, they don't do all the work for you, but they do mark out a path that you can follow. And so, if you want to dive deep and then soar high, then I would warmly recommend this set of three so far. Again, they're all half price, I believe. Uh, so, each of these is about $30 at the moment, and there's a fourth volume to come. But if you want something that will expand your mind and expand your soul as it does so, then these would be excellent volumes to get. So they're all outside waiting. And now for something slightly different. I have no idea whether I did this last time I was here, but I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to start some book chains. I have here four books. I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm going to put them on the steps at the front, and I'm going to tell you the deal. So the deal is this, first come, first serve. All of these books have been bought, they haven't been given to me, and that's important because it's fair dues when it comes to the book chain. I'm going to put them on the front, and the first person graciously, lovingly, and without physical violence to get the book can take that book. But if you take the book, you must read the book. And I give you a month to at least get well into it. Ideally, the sooner the better. If at the end of that month, you don't like the book, you must give the book to somebody else with the same deal, that they need to read it. They've got a month to do so. And at the end of that month, if they don't like it, they pass it on to somebody else. If you do like it, the deal is that by the end of the month, you buy another copy. And you give that copy to somebody else and tell them, if you like this at the end of the month, buy a copy and give it to somebody else and tell them the deal. If you don't like it, just give it to someone you think might and tell them the deal. Do you understand the deal? Great. Okay, here are the books. This was recommended to me by a, uh, one of the older men in the congregation which I serve. It's called God's Battle Plan for the Mind. Um, David Saxton is the author. It's the Puritan practice of biblical meditation. I remember reading uh, a lecture by uh, Ian Murray on the Puritan practice of meditation in which uh, he asserted that most Puritans as physicians of the soul, if we went to them today and said, well, I've got this problem and I'm struggling with this and I, I don't feel like that and so on and so forth, one of the first questions they would ask would be, well, are you meditating on the Word of God? Which is not perhaps the question that many of us would immediately ask if someone said, I'm, I'm struggling. This God's battle plan for the mind helps us to understand what scriptural meditation really is about. Not emptying the mind, as so much meditation today is meant to be, but a filling of the mind with truth and a chewing over of that truth so that it gets into our system 
and begins to, to permeate our souls and makes a difference then, not just to how we think, but therefore how we feel and therefore how we will. So this is a, an excellent little study of what it means to really ponder the truths of God so that they have an impact upon our lives. Then uh, this also is a, a beaky and smally production, uh, but this has to do with John Bunyan and the grace of fearing God. Now Bunyan was a man who understood something of the glory of God. He felt the weight of God's glory first of all as an unconverted man and then as a Christian man. And this is a lovely treatment of that understanding of holy fear, what it means to, to live in the presence of the Almighty with that desire to glorify and enjoy Him. And if you want to know more of, of that kind of spirit, then Bunyan is an outstanding guide and this is an outstanding guide to Bunyan. Then, uh, this is something that I've written from Evangelical Press. It's called A Face Like a Flint, Learning from the Righteous Determination of the Savior. Uh, the, the phrase from Isaiah, uh, where the Lord sets his face like a flint, I think has a, a counterpart when the Lord sets his face to go up to Jerusalem and everybody around him was scared. Why? Because the Lord was going up determined to accomplish the purposes which God his Father had established for him. And that is not only the way that our salvation was accomplished, it was also the way that our Lord would have us to walk in his footsteps. So um, it's, it's reasonably brief. I'll give you a couple of endorsements. Uh, not his best work. Thanks, Mum. And uh, <laughs> this book is okay. That was my wife. So. <laughs> and last but by no means least, The Glory of Christ by John Owen. Now this again, uh, like one of the books that was recommended yesterday, this has been abridged and slightly simplified, made it a little more accessible. It's one of the fruits of the last years of one of the Puritans whose uh, mind was illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And it is a, a stunning survey of Christ's glory revealed. I, I highly esteem John Owen. Not everybody finds him easy to read. Here he is made easier. But easier in terms of reading will still be challenging for the soul, but in a good way to hold up Christ in his person and his work. So, Saxton and Bunyan, they're going to be on this side, and then uh, A Face Like a Flint and The Glory of Christ are going to be over here. Now, that's sharp practice. <laughs> I'm not sure whether to be impressed or appalled. I didn't even get around the other side there. <laughs> you understand the deal? You got the deal? Okay, we've got the deal. Good. <laughs> well, if you would please turn in your Bibles now to Hebrews in chapter 12. Hebrews in chapter 12. Read mid with me, if you will, from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Hebrews 12 from verse 12. Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people, the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many become defiled. 
lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkest, darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure what was commanded, and if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace, by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray again. O oh God, most high and most holy, we tremble again to come into your presence because of your majesty, because of your greatness. We would not dare to come unless we could come in Christ Jesus. It is in his name. It is in dependence upon him. It is relying upon his blood and his righteousness that we can come to you even this day for the honor and glory of your name and for the blessing of our souls. Lord, impress upon us even this morning a fresh sense of heavenly reality. And by that, O oh God, we mean the knowledge of your glory. Lord, show yourself to us that we may come to you with love and with awe, with joy. For Jesus Christ's sake we pray. Amen. We began yesterday by asking, who are you and why are you? And it is important that God's people remember who they are and why they are. It's important that we understand to whom and where we really belong. Hebrews chapter 12 is in many respects again the climax of this letter, the final exhortation to holiness and to peace. And as we come to this chapter and as we pick up the threads of it in the middle of chapter 12, we have this warning against bitterness and profaneness. And this letter being written to believers of Jewish origin it has much to do with and relies heavily upon large portions of the Old Testament. 
And so this language is picked up from Deuteronomy and chapter 29, where in verses 18 and 19, we read about the, the idols of the land into which the people would go, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace even though I follow the dictates of my heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. That was the attitude of Israel of old. The writer to the Hebrews says, don't let that be your attitude today. Don't be gripped with a sense that others have got it better than you. Don't be gripped with this bitterness and this wormwood. Don't be like Esau, a fornicator and a profane person who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Esau prioritized his immediate desires. Esau wanted his belly filled in the here and now. John Bunyan, when he speaks in the Pilgrim's Progress of the Interpreter's House, has two boys, passion and patience. And passion is throwing a hissy fit because passion wants all his toys and his joys right now. And passion gets what he wants. And like a kid on Christmas morning, he plays with his toys and they get broken and tarnished pretty quickly. And patience is willing to wait for something better. Esau, passion, wants what he wants here and now. And when Esau prioritized what he could get his hands on and what he could fill his stomach with, he was despising his inheritance. The promised blessing was nothing to Esau. What lay in the future was disregarded by Esau because he wanted what he could get his hands on now. He had appetites. And that's why he can be described as a fornicator and a profane man. That was the pattern of his life. He wants everything here and now and he's willing to give up promised blessing of God for what he can now get his hands upon. And that is an echo of warnings that run all the way through the letter to the Hebrews. And in this climactic exhortation, in this concluding plea, the writer to the Hebrews is seeking to press home what he has been setting forth in the whole of, of what is essentially a written sermon, in which, if you remember, the keynote is consider him, holding forth the betterness of Jesus Christ and the new covenant in his blood, the glorious supremacy of what God has done in saving his people from their sins over all the types and the shadows of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And so, as we get into this conclusion, there is first of all a contrast that is established. And it is a definitive contrast which has been coloring the whole epistle up to this point. It's similar language to what is found, for example, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 25, where the Apostle Paul talks about Hagar and about um, Sarah. Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem which now is and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free which is the mother of us all. So you have this great contrast then that is being established. And here it is described in terms of the mountain that may be touched and the Mount Zion, the city of the living God which is the heavenly Jerusalem. And the writer says, you have not come to Mount Zion. And Mount Zion here is that representative of the old covenant. This is the mountain that may be touched. It is tangible. It is terrible. 
It is external. It is fearful. It is described for us in Exodus and chapter 19. And this mountain, which you could at least until the Lord came down and made himself known at Sinai, this was a mountain that you could get your hands on and that you could hear what was taking place. And it was a mountain that burned with fire when God drew near. There was a great swirling flame that burned around this mountain peak. And there was blackness as God came to his people. And there was darkness. There was gloom that descended as the Lord came upon the clouds of heaven quite literally. And there was a tempest as a storm swirled around this mighty peak. And there was a trumpet that sounded in such a way as to bring the people to their knees. And the very voice of God was heard from the mountain so that the people cried out and said, we cannot bear to hear God speak with his own voice to us as he gives the law. They could not endure what was commanded. That if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. Everything about this mountain said, keep back, stay away. My friends, I fear that in, in the age of Hollywood and in the age of special effects that are so stunning that we can barely write our employees here. We're accustomed to, to seeing these kinds of things represented on the big screen and afterwards going, wow, that was pretty great, wasn't it? So imagine that the hurricane has hit. And imagine that the storm is swirling around this building. And imagine that the windows are blowing in and the lights are going out and something has exploded and a fire nado is beginning to run its way around the top galleries. And the floods are beginning to rise and the storm is howling and it's whipping up the fire. And there's a great noise that fills this place like a thousand pianos exploding and like a thousand drum kits being played simultaneously. And there'd not be a single person here sitting in the pew going, wow, this is great. But rather, we've got to get out of here before we are consumed. And the people, when they saw this, even at something of a distance, they cried out, oh God, give us a mediator. Speak to us through someone, for we cannot bear what you are making known of yourself. And the mediator himself, a man with whom God spoke face to face, that mediator was exceedingly afraid and trembling. Moses shook with fear when he saw God on Mount Sinai. Everything here speaks of the awful glory of the God of heaven. And sin kept the people at a distance. How can I come near the God who has come down upon Sinai? Brothers and sisters, you have not come to that mountain. What a mercy. You have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. You have not come to the mountain where God mediated makes the mediator fear for his life. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, 
the heavenly Jerusalem. Not a mountain that can be touched now. Not the Jerusalem that is upon earth, but the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to an innumerable company of angels. You have come to the hosts of the Lord of hosts. You have come to the cherubim and the seraphim. You have come to that great heavenly army which cannot be calculated for number and glory, any member of the army of which, were he to appear before us now, would perhaps betray us into thinking that he himself was worthy of worship. And yet he is only one of the innumerable company of the messengers of the God, holy, 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 whom they all worship and adore. You have come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. You have entered into the kingdom of God. You have come to the people of whom it can be said in a far higher sense than it was ever said of the earthly Jerusalem, this one was born here. Not of the will of man, not of the flesh, but according to the will of God. The chosen, the elect and redeemed of the great God of heaven. You have come to God the judge of all, to the one who sits enthroned in the highest place, to the one whose eye is like a flaming fire, to the one whose word pierces to the very marrow of your being, to the one before whom all things are naked and open. You have come to the spirits of just men made perfect, You have come to those who are washed in blood and whose robes have been made white. Those who have been made clean because the Lamb has been slain and they have been brought by the power of His death and His life into the very presence of God. You have come to Jesus, the mediator, the go-between of the new covenant the God-man who stands between God in all his glorious holiness and man in all his fearful sinfulness and by his saving accomplishments has closed the breach not so much that man can now come to God as that God the Holy One of Israel may deal with man righteousness and mercy, justice and peace, meeting in God's dealings with lost mankind through his Son, Jesus Christ, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon Christ. It's not a like for like list. You're not meant to go, okay, so there's this mountain with this, and there's this mountain with that, and they're the equivalents, and then that's the equivalent of this, and that's the equivalent of that. Now this is this is this picture. The the whole the whole dimension of the whole thing, this portrayal of the one mountain Sinai with its fire and its darkness and its noise and the glorious mountain of the new Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God where the people of God gather with the angels of God and the mediator of the new covenant who does not draw back himself in fear, but welcomes us in to the very presence of God, the Savior who carries us up to his city. And this, Christian, this is where you have come. This is where you belong. This is your place. This is your privilege. And the writer to the Hebrews wants these readers 
and us readers and hearers. He wants us to understand the contrast that is being established. You have not come to Mount Sinai. That is not your inheritance. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. You have not come through Moses. You have come by Christ Jesus. You have come to know God in him. See that you don't, do not refuse him who speaks. What? What? You mean that it is possible to come to the mountain that is Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, and to refuse him who speaks? Yes, says the preacher. That is my concern that I want to express. It is possible to react wrongly, even to these things. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. What is the writer's concern? He said, Some saw the, the shock and awe of Sinai. And despite the visibility and the audibility, the tangibility, the immediacy of the display of the majesty of God in things that could be seen and touched and heard and felt, their reaction was superficial. It was temporary. The voice of God that spoke to them from the mountain had no abiding effect upon their souls. And they refused to hear what God was saying. They excused themselves from obedience. They turned their backs upon the living and true God whose voice rang in their very ears. They rejected His truth. They dismissed they put their stomachs first. What is the history of old covenant Israel in the wilderness? When did they make the golden calf? Seems before the smoke had even cleared from the mountain. Make us something, Aaron. Behold your God, O Israel. This is what brought you up out of Egypt. And you read their wilderness wanderings. And what do you come up against again and again? Bitterness. Why did this God of ours bring us out of Egypt? We had it fine there. We had it good there. We had everything that we wanted there. Everything that we, oh sure, we were slaves, but at least we had food. At least we had something to drink. At least we had a measure of security. This God who's redeemed us out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, we want to go back. Canaan's a long, long way away across this miserable desert. And there are lots of things and there are lots of people who are against us. And we don't like the way that God is dealing with us. The writer to the Hebrews has picked up that history, especially in chapters 3 and 4 of the letter. And he's emphasizing there again in just the same kind of language and with just the same tone and with just the same purpose. They had a promise of rest here upon earth and they hardened their hearts. 
God held out to them a land that was flowing with milk and honey. And they said, no, we want our stuff now. We'd rather have short-term, temporary, passing pleasures than the glories which lie ahead. Remember, this was the very choice that Moses had made. He esteemed the reproach of the people of God greater riches than the treasures that were in Egypt. He looked to the reward. But Israel as a whole, no. No, so many of them perished in the wilderness. And my friends, the writer picks up that history and he brings it into our lives, into the here and the now. And he says, don't do what they did. What makes you consider turning back? Is it promotion at work? What makes you compromise? Is it pleasure for your body? Is it the romance with that guy, that girl, that man, that woman? I have a pastor friend when somebody in this church, when a young person comes to him and says, Pastor, I'm really struggling at the moment. I'm just not feeling it. I'm not sure that this is really for me after all. I'm not really persuaded anymore that this is the truth of God. I'm not really gripped anymore by the worship of the Lord. I'm not really sure I'm a part of all this. Oh, he says, what's her name? What will you do for an easy life, friends? What are you ready to give up? Where are you willing to cut the corners? Where are you happy just to massage your convictions a little here or there so that it doesn't get too tough and it doesn't get too hard and it doesn't bite too deep and it doesn't cut too close? What makes you think about turning back. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then just shook the earth. That was all. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now we live at a time and in a place where the working assumption seems to be that God is a soft touch. Not about mercy, but about indulgence. If he's there at all, he doesn't really mind. And if he really minds, he doesn't really mind about me. Even in the professing church of Jesus Christ, there seems to be some kind of notion that the new covenant has somehow diminished or diluted God. That he is somehow lower and lesser than he used to be. The God of the Old Testament, he's the nasty God. He's the ugly God. He's the angry God. He's the unpleasant God. He's the wrathful God. But the God of the new covenant, he's the real deal. He's on our side. He doesn't mind too much. He's not going to take these things as seriously. My friends, the whole point of the writer to the Hebrews letters pleading with this church is that the new covenant, far from diluting and diminishing the majesty and the glory and the excellence of the true and living God, heightens and intensifies the revelation 
of his majesty and his glory and his countless excellencies. Back then, his voice only shook the earth. Its mere effect was a temporary localized earthquake. That's all. When he speaks now, he shakes heaven and earth. When the voice of God is now heard, everything shakeable shakes and everything passing passes and everything that was established collapses and all that men hold dear is swept away. Everything to which these Hebrew believers were tempted to cling All the visible glory of the temple and the priests and the sacrifices, that's passing away. And ultimately, the world itself as it now is. This present evil age, when God speaks, this world that he made is going to be folded up like a worn out garment. So thin and threadbare that by the time you've folded it together, it's not much bigger than a pocket handkerchief that you can stick in your pocket. And when God speaks like that, only the unshakable remains. Only the heaven-wrought kingdom of God. Only Mount Zion. Only the city of the living God. Only the heavenly Jerusalem, the innumerable company of angels, the general assembly and church of the firstborn registered in heaven, with God, the judge of all over all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the high priest, the high, high priest, and the great king of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And that's where you've come. Will you refuse him who speaks? When you've heard God speak to you in Christ Jesus, when you've come to him through the mediator of the new covenant, when you've entered into the kingdom which cannot be shaken, when you've been granted the faith that does not fall and fade and fail, that you've been promised the same inheritance as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. My friends, that is your privilege. And with that privilege comes an awesome responsibility. Where does the writer carry us in the light of this great contrast that has been established. Not Mount Sinai, not that, but Mount Zion. And this concern that's been expressed, if you've come to that mountain, don't turn away from the God who so speaks. What's the conclusion that he urges? Since We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken because that's true. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Remember who you are. Remember why you are. Remember whose you are. Remember where you belong. Not ignorance, not spiritual amnesia, not abandonment, but the author now standing with the readers, the preacher now standing with the hearers. We, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. We are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. 
This is confidence. This is not uncertainty. Remember, these warnings, these warnings are designed to bring us closer to God. These warnings are designed to help us examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith. These warnings are designed to expose hypocrisy. And they're designed to make sure that only that which can fall away falls away in the shaking. And we know that we have something which cannot be shaken. You have come, says this man to his fellow believers. Yes, you have come to this God. You have come to this city. You have come to this place. The language is there again. He uses it, for example, in chapter 6 and verse 9. It's woven in. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. The warnings are there and they are real. But the confidence is there and it is real. Or chapter 10 and verse 39. Again, the warning comes and the conclusion. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are of those who believe to the saving of the soul. Brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ this morning, this is your kingdom. This is your city. This is your hope. This is your confidence. This is your inheritance. You are kings and priests to your God. You are in Christ, in Him forever. Thus the eternal covenant stands. And if that's the case, let us have grace. Now why does he say that? Don't we have grace? The sense here probably could be better rendered let us be grateful. Let us show ourselves gracious in this. Have you grasped that gratitude lies at the heart of Christian obedience? In Romans chapter 1, what does the Apostle Paul complain about people's response to God? They neither glorified God nor were thankful. Despite all that he had made himself known to be, despite all the blessings that he had bestowed, there was no response of gratefulness. There was no sense of mercy received. Or again in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15, thanks be to God for this indescribable gift. The soul of Christian duty lies in this warm appreciation for what God has accomplished in saving a people from their sins. My friends, that's what Esau lacked. Esau was the inheritor of the promise. He was the older brother. And when Esau got hungry, Esau said, I couldn't care less about what God has promised me. I want something to eat now. And I'll take the here and now and I will cast off what ought to grip my soul with a sense of heavenly gratitude. What should Esau have said? Better to die now and have God and his mercies. Better to live with an empty stomach and to know that God is my God. Better to have the fruit shrivel on the vine. Better to have the crop wither in the field. Better to have the Chaldeans sweep across the land. And to rejoice in the God of my salvation. This is where true saints are motivated to service. This is what needs to grip the hearts of the Hebrews and my friends. This is what needs to grip our hearts. I'm not a Sinaiite. I'm a Jerusalemite. I don't draw my identity from what goes on in this world. I have been born from above. And I'm on my way to my heavenly home. Some of you will know the Heidelberg catechism it's three great divisions easily summarized as guilt 
Grace, gratitude. That's the title that hangs over the Heidelberg Catechism's entire description of Christian living. Gratitude. Let us have grace. Let us understand what God has done for us and what he has become to us. And since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have this grace. Let us be gripped by a sense of what we have received, who we have received, what we have received in him, in order that we may then serve God acceptably. Motivated by this sense of gratitude, gripped by the wonder of God's redeeming love, that we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And this is where I'd be happy with somebody saying, all of life is worship. Now, you need to be careful with that statement, because if all of life is worship, then really none of life is worship. That statement always sounds like it's elevating everything. It's what you're meant to think. Actually, it reduces everything. It makes life very, very flat. There are peaks. There are seasons. There are days in which we come near to God. There are particular expressions of our heart. There are promises of God attached to the gathering of the saints that are not attached to anything else. But here is a sense that whether it be the most apparently mundane of our day-by-day actions or the highest and purest expressions of our devotion to God. Everything I am and everything that I do ought to be seasoned with this sense of where I've come and whose I am, that I may serve God acceptably, that my whole life may be characterized by a desire to please the God of my salvation. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You have been redeemed at a price. You are no longer your own. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit. The God who has said, be holy for I am holy, calls us into a lifelong, all-encompassing, all-embracing pursuit of holiness. And you must do that with reverence and godly fear. With a humble acknowledgement of the mercy of God. with a, an awe because of who he is. Again, if you go back to chapter 5 and verse 7 of this epistle, remember, this is the conclusion of what has gone before. Here is Christ, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, was heard because of his godly fear. Not the carnal fear that gripped the people on Sinai that passed away when the smoke and the darkness had gone. But the holy fear, the righteous dread of a people who had come to understand the God with whom they had to do and the marvel of his mighty mercies in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. My friends, until we have grasped the compelling glories of the God who is revealed in the Christ of the new covenant, we will not serve him acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. I've heard prayers of thanksgiving for food reduced to this. Tarpa. Now, maybe you say they know no better. Is that how you approach 
the God of heaven and earth? When you come to worship him on the Lord's day, do you come with no regard for who you come to and what you come to do? Now, I'm not saying that you come to worship the God of heaven and earth the way that you would have come to Sinai. I am saying that you worship the God of heaven and earth the way you come to the God of the heavenly city. And that does not reduce him. And that does not diminish him. That does not dilute his glory. Who is this mediator of the new covenant? Who is the one by whom, through a new and living way, you and I can now enter into the very holy of holies? God, who in time past spoke to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. Is there less glory for us or more? If we have seen him, we have seen the Father, the express image of his person. My friends, we make no images of God because God has given us his image. We do not need to construct of our own wisdom and imagination some representation of God. God has shown himself to us in the person of his son. There his perfections shine. There his majesty is made known. There every attribute which makes God to be God is seen and known more highly, more purely, more brightly, more gloriously than it has ever been seen anywhere else. Would you see the justice of God? And see it as the stroke of judgment descends upon his beloved son, dying in the darkness of Calvary? Would you see the awesome holiness of your God? Would you see it more clearly than Isaiah saw it in the temple? Would you see it more clearly than Ezekiel saw it on the banks of that stinking Babylonian canal? Would you see it more clearly than any of the visions that were given to the saints of the old covenant? You see it when God says, such is my hatred of sin that my son must die that sin may not live in my people. Would you see the goodness of God? Lord, make your glory pass. I will show you all my goodness. And even then you'll have to hide in a cleft in the rock. Do you want to see the good glory of God? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of faith. Do you want to see mercy shine? Do you want to see the compassions of God? Do you want to see his faithfulness? Do you want to see his love shine? Do you want to see the outshining of the glory of God? Do you want to trace the lines of the face of divinity? Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. My friends, if that doesn't grip our hearts, then nothing does, and nothing will. If that leaves you cold, you need to ask God to forgive you your blindness and to open your eyes to behold the glory of God as it shines in the face of Jesus Christ. Serve God acceptably carried along, not by an unholy terror, 
but by the holy fear of a grateful heart that knows who it is, why it is, whose it is, where it belongs. For our God is a consuming fire. You might say, well, aren't we meant to end on a slightly higher note than that? It isn't the bit, well, this is the bit where we, we, we kind of take the edge off a little bit. You know, it is Mount Zion after all. It's not Mount Sinai. The writer is picking up again the language of Deuteronomy. He wants us to understand that the God whom we know in Christ Jesus is that God who always is, who always was, and who always is to come. The God who always is everything that he is, Father, Son, and Spirit. The God of whom Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24. The Lord your God is a consuming fire. He is a jealous God. Jealous of what? Jealous for his glory. I don't know if you ever have this conversation. Why is God so selfish? Ever heard anybody say that to you? When you're trying to communicate something of the, the majesty of God, that all things are to and through and for him. What makes God so special? Oh, you haven't seen him. You're blind to his beauties. You're ignorant of his mercies. Call upon him and he will show himself to you. God is a consuming fire, jealous for his own glory. God loves himself supremely. And in any mere creature, that would be a travesty. But only God, infinitely lovely, is the fit object of God's own infinite love. And only God, infinitely lovely, is the fit object of your feeble affections, your heart's desires. It's an image of moral purity with mighty power. My friends, God has not been in any way reduced when we come to Mount Zion. His attributes shine in Christ. And the confidence which you and I enjoy in coming to God in Christ Jesus can never, never, never make us casual and careless. If your notion of God is such that you can ignore what he says, you don't know him. If your sense of God is such that it doesn't matter how you think and feel and act, then you do not yet have a true sense of him. If your God doesn't mind what you do, where you go, who you're with, how you live, what you can get away with. If your God, you think, doesn't see into the corners of not just your life, but your very heart. If your God's the God who can be put aside so that you can fill your stomach here, then you don't know the God who saves by Christ. What shall we do? Asked this author at the beginning of his letter. What shall we do to escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Brothers and sisters, our God is a consuming fire. Not a God, not the God, my God your God. All that glory, all that majesty, all that splendor, all that excellence, the God who dwells in light, unapproachable and full of glory. 
the God who sits enthroned on high. The God in whom there is not the merest hint of darkness. The God with whom there is no shadow of turning. The God from whom come down all good and perfect gifts. I am his. He is mine. Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises. A God who does wonders. The consuming fire of the Almighty. And I belong to him. And you and I, we can call this God Abba, Father. And that which is a terror to his foes is a joy to his children. That which is a horror to his enemies is the wonder of his saints. You can imagine a child in trouble. He's being beaten up. He's having a really rough time. He's down on the ground. They're kicking him now. And suddenly this absolute brute of a man comes out of a nearby house. And he rushes toward the fight. And the bullies scatter. They can't understand why the kid who's been cowering on the ground isn't running for his life. It's because the man that they see as a monster is his father. He's a terror to them, but he's the savior of his child. Someone might say, you have an awful God. Oh, I do. I do. I have an awful God. He speaks now not just to shake the earth. I come not to a mountain that can be touched, that flames with fire, where there is darkness and gloom, where there's the sound of trumpets and a voice. I come to the judge of all. I come to the heavenly Jerusalem. I come to the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, I come to this God, our God, your God and mine, who is and ever must be a consuming fire. And when that consuming fire bursts forth in judgment upon this fallen world, and everything that passes away passes away, one kingdom will stand. One people will endure. One throne will last. One army will march in ranks. One glory will be revealed. And it is that of the unshakable king in his unshakable kingdom. My friends, Let's not refuse him who speaks. Whatever question needs to be asked, whatever conundrum we face, whatever conviction is threatened, whenever the path of holiness is undermined, whenever Satan dangles his baits and tries to hide the hook, whenever you are threatened, or cajoled, or enticed, or seduced, or entreated, or pushed, or pulled away from the path of righteousness. I know who I am. I know why I am. I know whose I am. I know where I belong. I know where I am going. And by grace, I will serve my God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for my God is a consuming fire and I adore, worship, honor and serve him. Amen.
Let's pray. O oh God of heaven, we have not known you as we ought. We have not understood you as we might have done. We have not grasped your excellent glory. Father, we have too often played at religion. We have diluted your truth. We've been casual about your worship. We've been careless about our lives. We have not lived before you. We have spoken, we have read, we have watched, we have played, we have indulged as if you were not there and you did not know. Have mercy, O oh God, have mercy for Jesus' sake. Blot out our transgressions, our Father, and establish and renew our sense of where we have come to that Mount Zion which is above. Help us, O oh God, to fix our eyes upon the goal. Grant that we may never turn back to the flesh pots of Egypt. O oh God, detach our souls from the things of this present evil age. Help us to set our minds on things which are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the majesty to wait eagerly for his coming. O oh Lord, if we are those who have indeed turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for your Son from heaven, even Jesus who is delivering us from the wrath which is to come, then grant now, most holy God, that we may indeed live before you, live as inheritors, with the saints in the light and live to the praise of the glory of your grace. For Jesus' sake, amen.